Luke twenty two fifteen through 16. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The Last Supper is, is central to the Christian faith. In fact, when Jesus gave his followers a way to understand him, he did not give them a philosophy. He didn't give them a theory to, to, to learn. He gave them a meal to share. A meal that speaks uh, more volumes than any theory. It is a meal that when you look at it, symbolizes God's love. It was the Passover meal, which came with it all kinds of significance from Israel. You see, Luke has told us all along, this Gentile writer has told us all along that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to accomplish a new exodus. Luke 9, 30 through 31, and, he, and behold, two men were, were talking with him. Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his what? Which he was about to accomplish where? Now that word departure in the actual Greek is the word exodus. Who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. You see, Jesus has come to do for the whole world what God did through Moses in Egypt for Israel. When the cries of God's enslaved people reached its pinnacle, hallelujah, God stepped in. And you need to know something today, that when the cries of our hearts reach their pinnacle, hallelujah, God always steps in. He may not step in the way you expect him to, or the way that you want to, but you need to know something, God is with you wherever you go. Galatians, Paul talks about it. He says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Friends, you have to understand that the arrival, the incarnation of Christ is the central thesis of scripture. It is the pinnacle. It is the climax. That when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been what? You see, that's what we have to understand is that every single Passover meal since Egypt's exodus pointed and culminated in this Passover meal. Every other Passover meal was just a shadow, was a signpost pointed to this Last Supper. I have earnestly desired this, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. But as you read the Bible, you realize something, and that is Jesus has been waiting a lot longer than just three and a half years that he's been with the disciples. He isn't just talking about the three and a half years he's been with the disciples. No, Jesus has been waiting a whole lot longer than the 30 plus years that he's walked on this earth in human form. No, Revelation 13, 8 says that the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. You see, from the moment Adam and Eve sinned, a lamb had to be sacrificed in order to cover their nakedness. And Jesus, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, has earnestly desired to eat this Passover with the human race. I have been waiting for this. This is what creation, this is what every sinner has been waiting for since sin interrupted God's plan. And that is God's solution for the sin. From the moment he's been eagerly awaiting. Paul says, well, Paul doesn't say there. It's not there. <laughs> Paul says in Romans 8, 19, all of creation has been waiting with eager longing for this moment. For what Jesus would do and what he would do through people, through him. 
Now, the thing about this Last Supper is when you look at it at first, and, and we don't get it, but any, any modern-day Jew of that time and any Orthodox Jew of, of today's day and age, they would have noticed something very uh, something that was missing. Because at first, in our context, you know, all the essential ingredients seem a, a, as though they are there. You got the unleavened bread, it's there. You got the wine, it's there. But suddenly you realize, like Isaac on his way up, up Mount Moriah with his father. Where in the world is the lamb for the Passover? And as Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So Jesus quickly tells the disciple, this is why there is no lamb on the table. It is because I am sitting at the table. Passover, Passover is nothing without Jesus. That's what it was pointing to, was to Jesus Christ, the true Passover, the true Lamb. Luke 22, 19 through 20. Jesus says, this is my body. Why don't you have a lamb? Because to not have the lamb at Passover, you always ate the lamb at the Passover. And so Jesus connects himself to Passover. I'm the lamb. This is my body which is given for you. This is the cup that is poured out for you. Friends, the Last Supper is central to Christianity. There have been many sermons that have been written, and there have been, been many points that have been made. But I want to focus on just one point. Just one point today. And that is the name of the Last Supper. You see, the reason why it's called the Last Supper is because uh, uh, for Jesus and the disciples, this was the Last Supper. They would never eat together again. Nothing would ever be exactly the same again. And when you think about it in this life, every supper is a Last Supper, supper because everything is constantly changing. Nothing ever remains the same. There are people who are here in the church today who will participate in communion that will not be here next time we have communion. There are people who are here at the last communion, and we hold communion at once every quarter, not once a year, but there are people who were here last communion service who are not here today. Children grow up and couples break up and friends give up and members move away and, and sadly people die. But I want to challenge you with this one thought this morning. If the disciples knew that that was their last supper, you think that might have changed them just a little bit. Had the disciples know, you know, maybe instead of all the arguing over who would be the greatest... Maybe instead of trying to push their agenda for God's kingdom, maybe they would have just relished in the minutes and the moments with Jesus. Then all the fighting, that all that fighting and the bickering and all the complaining and backbiting, all of that was just time, a waste of time. As, 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 as David put so eloquently in, in, in his prayer, it amounts to nothing, uh, no, no, not a hill of beans. That all that fighting and bickering was all just a waste of time, distracting them from what mattered most. Love for each other and love for God. You know, that is really all that has ever mattered. I know we think a lot of things matter. You want to know what matters? The, the, this is the main thing that matters. Loving God and loving others. That's the most important. That is all that has ever really mattered. If the disciples knew that it was their last supper, how that might have changed them. If we would start seeing each Sabbath, each day, each supper, each conversation as our last, do you think that would change our discussions? No, we would no longer be 
arguing over the color of the carpet. We wouldn't be arguing over the music that we sing. We wouldn't be arguing over the order of service. We would not be constantly pushing for our political agenda. We would focus on what really matters, loving God and loving each other. You see, with every, as with every election, some of us have been mourning this week, and some of us have been celebrating. It's like that at every election. I want you to remember this, though, that no matter what, no matter who is elected, we must always keep our love for God and each other as greater than anything else. Our bonds in Christ Jesus are far greater than, than what you who you want to see in the White House. I just hope some of us put as half, if, if, if some of us put half the energy into proclaiming Christ as we did into our politics, man, we'd be in the kingdom already. Our bond in Christ should be greater than our disagreements on who the president is. How different the disciples would have been had they known this was their last supper. How different our conversations would be if we knew that this was our last supper. Well, we wouldn't waste it. You know, think of the conversations that we have at home. Think of the conversations that we have with each other. If we knew that that was our last time at the dinner table together, would we waste it over arguing or complaining or tearing down church leadership? Would we waste it by sitting in front of the television set with our eyes glued to the tube? Turn that thing off. Would we be constantly obsessed with our Facebook feed? Turn that stuff off. We wouldn't waste it on another pointless argument. No, if we knew that was the Last Supper, we would celebrate the minutes and the moments that we have with each other. You see, the reality is that every supper is really our last supper. There are people missing from the table that were at here last communion service, but some like Judas have died. And some like Peter have been sifted like wheat. And some like Thomas have given to doubt. Some like James and John uh, are so focused on themselves and they don't know of anybody else in the room. Some, like the rest of the disciples, have all disappeared. You see, no two suppers are ever the same. No two Sabbaths are ever the same. Think about it. Never again will we have a Sabbath where all these same people are together here like they are here right now. No two days are ever the same. No two conversations are ever the same. Are you having the kind of conversations that, that, that you know what, I may not see that person tomorrow. There's always someone changing. There's always someone missing. But Jesus made an amazing promise at the Last Supper that I want you to hold on to, church, today and every day for the rest of your life. Jesus says in Matthew 26, 29, he says, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, friends, the promise of the Last Supper is that, is that if Christ is our Passover and we partake of his life, then no supper will ever be your Last Supper. You see, the dark powers may still rage, and like Pharaoh and his army pursuing the Egyptians after Passover, they may pursue, but they have been defeated, and our salvation is secure. Hallelujah, uh, Christ, the seed of the woman, has crushed the serpent's head. So they may still pursue, and they may still come on us, and they may still press on us, and they may still surround us, and they may even kill us. But the promise of the Last Supper is that no supper has to be your Last Supper. Revelation 19.9 says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Friends, there are no truer words than the words of God. 
People say stuff and they don't follow through. Politicians say stuff and they don't follow through. Uh, even, even spouses and loved ones can say stuff and not follow through. But God wants you to know, in the last book of the Bible, when I say something, I mean it. These are the true words of God. You see, friends, John has seen it in vision, which means it's going to happen. This isn't some dream where, 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 where John is, is just kind of giving an, giving an idea of what it's going to look like. It's vision, which means the time uh, reality is torn. And John is given an actual glimpse into the future reality. John has seen it. Jesus has said it. Which means you and I can bank on it. This world may be loaded with last suppers, last moments, last laughs, and last loves, and last conversations. But the promise of the last supper is that no supper needs to be our last. Because there is no relationship that Jesus cannot heal. And there is no sinner that, 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 that he cannot seal. And there's no painful experience that Jesus cannot feel or does not feel. Because Jesus allowed his life to ultimately become a meal. To be broken up. To, for his blood, blood to have been shed. For, us, for, for, for him to be devoured. Because Jesus was willing to do that, we have a guarantee of a supper when no death, no pain, no prejudice, and no sin will ever separate us again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's called the Last Supper because that was the last time Jesus and his disciples were ever together like that again. Cling to each moment as though it might be your last. Live for the kingdom as though each day may be your last. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the awesome God that you are. For all that you have done and all that you are doing. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We know that the ultimate solution for our world and our hearts is the King of Kings coming in His glory. And so, Lord, we pray that you come quickly. I pray for each person here. May we, as we participate in communion today, See this, as, as many of us have been through this time and time again, Lord, I pray that we do not tread callously and quickly into your presence, into these symbols and these emblems, but that we will see and realize that Jesus' body really was broken for us, that Jesus' blood was, was uh, thoroughly shed for us, that because of our sin. You, God, had to die. May we, may we go into this communion service receiving your love and grace. May people here, those of us who maybe haven't made a decision for you, I ask and I pray that right now, today is the day of salvation, that they may make a decision for you. That as we participate in this communion, this will be the last supper where you are not the King of kings and Lord of lords of our lives. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.